I always love to be off camera with a beautiful woman because it takes all the attention away from me and it goes right to her. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I don't want to be. You're not. Okay. Thank you so much for coming and thank you for everybody who has been waiting for us to be alive today with, uh, with Dr. George Avedian uh, with the presentation about the, the newest update about opioid epidemic. So a little bit about Dr. George Avedian. Uh, he is a family practitioner with 37 years of clinical uh, experience caring for a diverse multicultural community in Upper Darby. And, um, since 2011, he has held the position of Senior Medical Advisor for Delaware County. He maintains clinical privileges at Delaware County Memorial Hospital, and he is currently the President of Delaware County Medical Society. He is a member of the Delaware County Heroin Task Force, where he chairs its medical subcommittee. He also co-chairs the Health Advisory Board of Delaware County. Dr. Avedia is a fellow of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia and is an adjunct faculty member of the Louise Katz School of Medicine at Temple University. He has numerous membership, memberships in local and national medicine, medical societies. Dr. Avedia lectures to local community groups on the current heroin epidemic with an emphasis on prevention, awareness, and the proper medical treatment of those in need. He also performs consulting work for adult pharma on nasal nerve and solution. As a passionate community member, Dr. Avedian chairs the board of directors of the Center of Resolution, a local nonprofit focused on conflict resolution and youth aid panels. He also chairs the board and is current member of the Armenian Sisters Academy School, located in Radnor, Pennsylvania. Since 2012, he has been an active member of the Health Literacy Coalition of Delaware County, and he is a proud pa parent of three accomplished children. And we have to say, we are proud of uh, him have, having, uh, because he is one of our referring doctors as physical KOA. Thank you so much for your time and we'll for the great yes. presentation. Thank you for having me. Okay, <clears throat> well obviously the uh, heroin the opioid epidemic, we're not going to call it a heroin epidemic, is really um, something that's very, very severe at the present time. In, in Delaware County, we saw this uh, on the map uh, long before it got national attention. And we were very proactive in the process. And what we did is we, uh, through our former district attorney, Jack Whalen, we set up a heroin task force. <clears throat> and back then we realized, and the statistics show, that by the time you get to the individual that has an overdose on uh, an opioid, it's usually too late. The mechanism that it causes death is through respiratory depression or respiratory arrest. In you know four to six minutes, you can have irreversible brain damage, and another four to six minutes, you don't have a patient, you don't have an individual anymore. So time is of the essence. And when you look at statistics across the country, the arrival time for first responders, even in an urban setting, can exceed that time that you have to respond to that patient. So what we did in Delaware County through the leadership of our former district attorney is we put naloxone, which is the same chemical compound as Narcan, into the hands of every law enforcement individual in the county, which was a difficult thing to do because you have different municipalities, different law enforcement, different police chiefs, and you have to have them all buy in on it. They were very supportive. We initiated the process, and back in November of 2014, we saved the very first life. Back then, it was a little bit more cumbersome than it is today. It was a two-step process. We had to uh, give them the compound naloxone, and they would then put it in an atomizer and put it into the patient's person's nose and wait to see if they would respond. What we found was it was very successful. We started to save a lot of lives. 
In February of 2016, the um, Narcan nasal spray became available commercially and it was uh, brought to the market. It was um, expedited through FDA. The, actually, the company is located very close to where we are in Radnor, their corporate headquarters. <clears throat> and Adapt placed nasal Narcan spray on the market. We, in Delaware County, and I realize I think we're here in Chester County, but in Delaware County, we were the first entity worldwide to purchase it. So we transitioned from the two-step process, which was a generic form of the Narcan, and we started to use the nasal Narcan spray, which is very convenient, very easy to use. So immediately all law enforcement got it, and we continued the process. But in addition to providing Narcan, you, know, you have to educate the community. And we started having uh, programs at um, the, the medical society, for example, uh, community groups, and we instructed them on uh, how to use the Narcan nasal spray and you know, its efficacy and its benefits. The, uh, the product was very, very simple to use and very easy to use, and it doesn't require any real special training. The good thing is the company that manufactures it has a website that shows you how to use it. There's an app that you can get on your cell phone that shows you how to use it. And initially on that app, it was so user-friendly that there was a, uh, a button that you could hit and it would call 911, you'd get police right away. On the app, it showed you how to administer it. And even had a, a map where you could GPS locate a pharmacy to get it. <clears throat> Initially, now it's really saturated. You can pretty much get it in any pharmacy in any location throughout the country. I uh, <clears throat> I do consulting work for uh, Adapt Pharma. At the time, it was Adapt. Now Adapt sold to another company about a, a year or so ago. It's called Emergent Bio Solutions, and the um, product has obviously uh, been very well. Um, advertised and communicated throughout the entire medical community and through the lay community, and we encourage its use. I speak to physician groups on a regular basis, and what we encourage the doctors to do is to co-prescribe. In other words, if you're a dentist, and I have a dentist for the audience here, um, I have to say I've been in for quite a few years, oh, yeah. and I was uh, in the Armenian Sisters Academy. Oh, wow. Well. And um, you know, dentists treat a lot of uh, patients with pain. And uh, they write for opioids on a regular basis. And there's a need for it. But anytime you prescribe an opioid, what we do is we always compare them to morphine. Morphine is the um, comparator. <clears throat> the modern opioids, the fentanyls and, and you know, the more potent synthetic opioids are extremely potent. And what we do is we put them on a, a scale so we can compare one to another. It's not used for medical purposes to prescribe, but it kind of gives us as physicians an idea as to how, for example, uh, fentanyl compares to um, morphine. Well, the ratio for, the, for that product is four to one four times the potency. And then when you get to a, what we call morphine milligram equivalents, once you get past 50, you really have a risk uh, greater than twofold, and it becomes exponential at that point when it goes up to 900 MME. And what we do is we encourage physicians to co-prescribe the Narcan with the um, product that they're using for pain. <clears throat> So obviously, as physicians, you know, we see um, patients that have fractures or uh, patients that have, uh, you know, cancer pain. Uh, obviously, dentists see a lot of uh, dental issues that cause a lot of discomfort. We have to understand, these products are good products. They have a place in the medical uh, toolbox. However, they do come with some baggage, and that's why we encourage the use of the Narcan. 
code prescription of our account. <clears throat> now, when we talk about uh, the product itself, um, very safe, very effective. It's very um, easy to use. Is uh, is very very simple. It's uh, a little. I wish I had bought one. I didn't bring one with me today. But you just place it into a nasal cavity, and it was a little plunger. You squirt it in there, and you wait a, two to three minutes to see if you get a response. And if you don't, you get a, a, a you apply a second dose. It comes packaged two doses per box, and they're blister packed. And there's instructions on the box that it comes with. So, <clears throat> what we did in Delaware County again, we were the first statewide to have a heroin task force. And we kept the name heroin, even though the products out there are really not heroin that we're seeing as much as, for example, the uh, opioids. But we kept the the, the term heroin task force. So we were first statewide to do that. We were first statewide uh, to initiate uh, naloxone and subsequently Narcan into the hands of all of our uh, law enforcement. And uh, you know we worked very collaboratively. We put together a heroin task force. County leadership was 100% committed to it. And now we have seen where that model has spread throughout the state. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> in about two, three weeks, I think it's the 25th of this month, we have a regional uh, task force, and it consists of Delaware County, Montgomery County, Chester County, uh, Bucks County, uh, Delaware's, uh, I forget which county that would be, in uh, Newcastle, I guess, mm -hmm. and Camden County as well as Philadelphia County as part of that regional group. And we get together and we have programs to brainstorm, you know, best practices and, and what we can do to work collaboratively as a team to address this, this crisis. So we, uh, you know, we, we've been very uh, fortunate that um, up until now, uh, the uh, program has worked exceptionally well. And now what we're seeing is the number of deaths starting to come down. Um, the number of deaths due to the opioids. Unfortunately, um, we're seeing a little bit of a rise in amphetamine, amphetamine use. As a matter of fact, I believe yesterday in the news you may have read, uh, there was a, a couple of individuals at Drexel Hill that uh, succumbed and apparently, again, I don't have all the details, but. It was a mixture of a fentanyl with an amphetamine. Now, Narcan works perfectly well on opioid overdose, but it doesn't do anything for the amphetamine. So <clears throat> that's what we have. These drugs have been around for a long time. Okay, um, if we go back to 3400 BC to a little history lesson here, <clears throat> to the area that was referred to as Mesopotamia, the area between the Tigris and Euphrates River in modern-day Iraq. There's literature that has been identified showing the use of the opium poppy as an analgesic. That's you know, quite a while. <laughs> If you fast forward and you go to about, I forget, Hippocrates is around three or 400 BC. And as the father of medicine, Hippocrates um, uh, referenced the use of opium in the treatment of individuals that had the need for analgesic uh, control. What happened uh, that really expedited the use and really um, pushed the use of uh, these products it was back around 20 years ago or so. Um, we started looking at the fifth vital sign. I mean, when you went into the hospital, you would see, you know, in the patient's rooms, you know, uh, little uh, charts looking at pain management. And pain became the fifth vital sign, in addition to you know, blood pressure, temperature, uh, pulse, respiration. Now we were monitoring their pain. And 
you know, um, became a very important part of patient care. <clears throat> but it also, at the same time, promoted the use of these products, the, the narcotics for pain management. And then, of course, what you see in the news today, you know, a lot of misinformation. Um, the, some of the pharmaceutical companies were putting out, uh, pushing these products um, inappropriately. And unfortunately, now there's a ton of litigation. As a matter of fact, Delaware County was the first one to sign on for litigation in the state of Pennsylvania against um, several of the pharmaceutical companies. I keep plugging Delaware County. You have to understand that's where I'm from. <laughs> My heart and soul is, is, is I'm a Delco guy. <clears throat> so in, in, uh, in any case, the problem is a huge national problem. And um, it is being addressed. It needs to be addressed on multiple levels. We address it not only locally as we do here in Chester County, and Delaware County, but it's on the state level. And it's also on the federal level. Um, what happened, our model was so well received, we actually had it, the Secretary of Health and Human Services come down <clears throat> and we had a nice little round table meeting where we shared with him our concerns and, and our programs. And in March of last year, I was invited to, to the White House at the uh, opioid summit that they had where uh, President Trump at that time announced his program and the fact that he was going to be throwing more money into the uh, dealing with the problem. Um, I think the most important way of dealing with the opioid epidemic is education. You know, we need to educate the community, we need to educate physicians, and we all need to be aware as I said earlier, a, these, these are very good products. They're very effective, they're very efficient, they are an important tool, but they do come with um, a little bit of baggage. And for that reason, we need to be proactive and, and, and careful when we use them as physicians, as dentists, and we need to um, educate our patients and let them know that you know, there are potential side effects and hope that uh, we can minimize the, uh, the problem. <clears throat> Unfortunately, what we found was people that became addicted to the opioids were unable to afford buying it through prescription method, and that's where they started going to the street and buying the illegal drugs. <coughs> and they would uh, originally, you know, it was primarily heroin, but then you had the more uh, potent compounds uh, go on the street, the fentanyls and so on. And for a little while there, um, car fentanyl was a, a product that was um, being thrown out on the street. And that's a product that has absolutely no use in, in human medicine. I believe it's, it's meant to be used as a, um, uh, a narcotic for in the vet, um, community for elephants and rhinos and, and it's also for just well, you know it's interesting my daughter's a veterinarian and I asked her have you ever and she she's a equine specialist horse specialist they're large animals and I said have you ever used or seen car fentanyl used and she said absolutely mm -hmm. never oh. so you know this is a drug that you know, was coming in primarily from China being put on the street and it was almost instant death you know it was uh, it's such a potent compound. So, you know, the bottom line is um, anything that's on the street, you have no idea what you're getting. And, you know, we really hope that the individuals don't go to that. What we've also done in Delaware County, um, and we did this just recently, and we have a, it's a pilot program that we're doing for the regional group. <clears throat> and what happens is with the death of individuals, there are victims, and the victims now become the family members. These are people who have lost their brother, their sister, their mother, their father, their cousin, and now they are suffering because of the loss of a loved one. And 
their needs have to be addressed also. So we have what we called, it was originally called the pilot group for the survivors. And uh, our group has now gotten an official label, Delco Survivors United. We have a group of individuals who have lost a loved one, as well as members of our medical society, as well as um, members from the district attorney's office and from the community. And that group is addressing the needs of surviving family members. So, you know, again, that, that's something that's extremely important. The other thing that's pretty much widespread now is uh, anytime an individual uh, needs help, we have what we call certified recovery specialists. And these are individuals who are trained and they're very well versed on the tools and the programs and the infrastructure of support for individuals that are suffering the uh, problem of addiction. And these certified recovery specialists are then engaging, interacting with the individual and walking them through the process if, if they are agreeable to it. So as you can see, it's, it's a really a, a, a multi-pronged approach. We were uh, dealing with this problem at all levels. Um, the one thing I, I can say, and which I really uh, feel very good about, uh, and I mentioned earlier on, District Attorney Jack Whalen started the program. Our current District Attorney, Kathleen Copeland, has continued it, and I find that, you know, she's a very uh, empathetic, compassionate individual, cares about the community, cares about the individuals, but at the same time, deals with the bad guys to make sure that the, the poisons they're putting on the street are not uh, readily available. So, you know, I'm only one little part of this team, and uh, I'm proud to be part of this team. I think we've accomplished a lot over the years. We still have a lot more to accomplish, and uh, yeah, we're here to uh, do whatever is necessary. I'd like to thank uh, Tala for inviting me here to physical and, and Paoli. Um, it's a great facility. I can put a plug in because I've referred patients here and the patients have come back and, and really uh, uh, spoke extremely high of, of the services that you provide here. So, thank you. Can I ask a question? Sure you can. Okay. Um, can you tell me what are considered amphetamine? Okay. <clears throat> Amphetamines are a class of drug that are stimulants. Okay. And what they do is they stimulate the nervous system. Um, if you want to go back historically, one of the biggest groups that used amphetamines were truck drivers back in the day before they had restrictions on the number of hours that they could work. And as a stimulant, it kept them awake and alert and able to drive for many more hours than they normally would. Um, there are uh, amphetamines that have come to the market and have been taken off the market. Um, a lot of amphetamines that are available on the street are coming out of uh, illegal labs and they're being uh, manufactured and distributed by drug dealers. But they are stimulants. They work differently than opioids. Opioids act more as a depressant and in a high dose, they become a respiratory depressant. And that, as I mentioned, the mechanism of death is they stop breathing. But amphetamines work through different mechanism and they don't respond to the Narcan. Um, are steroids that you might take for a limited period of time for pain reasons considered amphetamines? No, a steroid is a, is a different class of medication. Steroids are different, amphetamines are different, and opioids are different. Steroids are in a class of anti-inflammatory medications, okay? Um, they decrease inflammation, and in the process of decreasing inflammation, they can also help alleviate pain. They are used a lot in rheumatologic problems, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, for example. But we have other drugs that we also use. Um, much more 
fact that a better modern drugs uh, to treat the rheumatoid problems. But steroids still have a place. Um, they are not narcotic. They are not amphetamine. They're just uh, anti-inflammatory. We have anti-inflammatories that are non-steroidal. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as aspirin, ibuprofen, those are uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And they work very well for pain also. You know, the Motrin's, the Aleve, the, uh, the ones that are most uh, commonly utilized are very effective pain management. Yes, I have a question. Um, sure. So I'm a dentist, I work right next door. Um, <laughs> Question, I mean, right now, I don't like to prescribe opioids for pain, you know, just because of what's going on. I'm always cautious about that. Um, you know, they're telling us, you know, the dentist, you know, give them patients maybe 600 milligrams of Motrin and extra and Tylenol at the same time, and you know, that should do it for pain. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything I should be looking for? Let's say I wanted to write a Percocet or something like that nature. You know, what should I be looking for as a pain? You know, I don't like to deal with pain, basically. I just like to take the tooth out, send them on their way. Um, but I'm, I'm in this new breed of dentist where we're afraid to write opioids now because we see what's going on. Um, but, you know, let's say, I don't know, it's a, it's a weird example, but let's say you, you need to do like a little surgery on the arm or something, what would you prescribe? That's interesting because yeah. everyone's threshold of pain is different. Yeah. Okay? Um, and again, opioids are drugs that have a place in the medical toolbox. Sure. But as I said, you know, I'll give you myself as an example. Sure, right. I cracked a tooth maybe about oh, nice. four months ago, yeah. okay? and I had, ended up having a um, root canal, and I had to have, I guess it's called post and crown. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Um, during the entire process, mm -hmm. I only used ibuprofen to manage right. the pain. Um, but I could see where the pain is severe enough right. that someone may need a more potent product. As long as you use it judiciously, sure. there's no real downside to it. Um, you're obviously trained in this proper use, sure. and I like the fact that you're a little skeptical and a little resistant to use it because that's shown that you're concerned about the safety sure. of the patient. Um, but again, you need to know the product that you're prescribing and the morphine milligram equivalent of the product. And you know, you're primarily dealing with acute pain. Sure. Acute pain is very you know, short-term management. You're not writing large quantities of an opioid, whereas in chronic pain, <clears throat> someone uh, may be given you know many months of, of supply, and the risk is much higher. Okay. The other thing that you have to also realize, um, in addition to the patient who's at risk, there are other um, risk entities. So number one is the individual who's taking the drug. That individual is potentially at risk for opioid-induced respiratory depression. Those that live in the household are also at risk. For example, if there's little children in the house and they get a hold of that drug and accidentally ingest it, they can be uh, potentially at risk. It can also be misused within the household. For example, um, you're a weekend warrior, you decide you're gonna go out on a beautiful day like today and cut the trees and rake the leaves and you spend like the next uh, 10 hours outdoor and then you come back in the house and now you're, you're, you're torn apart. And then you go to your wife or you go to your, your, your brother, your cousin and say, can I think of pain? Well, obviously we would hope that it's going to be a little bit of an ibuprofen or something, but people do take medications that are not prescribed for them. And so that's one, one form of um, a diversion, they would call it. But the real concern is the illegal use. What we found <clears throat> in our heroin task force is we actually had representatives from the community. One was a real estate uh, person. And found that during real estate open houses, people would go in and go right to the medicine cabinet to see if they could get a narcotic and, and take it. And that was their only purpose of going into the house during, during an open house. So yes, 
you know, the products can be um, putting others at risk. Um, but again, I like your approach. You know, you're very cautious the way you're going to use it. Uh, and you're not really using it for uh, long periods of time and in large quantities. But if you go on to the, the CPC uh, has an app. You can get it on your cell phone. Nice. I have it on mine. <laughs> and on that app, it basically shows you and does all the calculations for you. There's the app right there as I open it up. Oh, nice. And um, it's uh, very effective. And what it does is that you can put down the uh, product that you're using and you can ask it gives you opioid prescribing checklist CDC guideline for prescribing in chronic pain opioids are not first line therapy it, yeah. and these are things that are sure. on the opioid uh, app that you can get right off of the uh, CDC website and then I mentioned about the Narcan this is the uh, app that uh, um, the manufacturers of Narcan have, and on that app it goes through all of its uh, uh, safety and administration. It has a little video on how to administer it. Uh, yeah, kind of stuff. Use the technology. A great tool to have, also. Okay. I have a few more questions. Uh, okay, I'm here for you. <laughs> Is Tylenol with codeine considered an opioid? Codeine is a narcotic. Okay. It is not a potent product, okay? And it's very rare that someone who's taking Tylenol or codeine is gonna have any sort of problem. Where you can also run into problems, and I'm not speaking about Tylenol or codeine right now, I'm just speaking about opioids, is with other drugs that individuals may be taking, okay? And let's talk about, for example, an individual that has a, a broken arm and is given a, a narcotic, okay? A legitimate use. But let's say that person is also taking a, a tranquilizer chronically, a benzodiazepine, Xanax, Valium, Ativan, one of those. Both of them are respiratory depressants. So now you can have a, uh, almost like a supplemental type effect. Let's say they drink alcohol. Alcohol is a respiratory depressant. So when you start adding all these things up, you can put the patient at risk. So that needs to be looked at. I mean, it's a concern. But again, Tylenol with codeine is not, a, is not one of the products that we are really that concerned about. Okay, I have another. Um, in Philadelphia, at least at one particular library, um, they ran a whole series on how they had, is it, what is the um, remedy again, Narcan? Narcan. Yeah. Um, have you suggested that maybe that be done in some of the larger libraries in this area, or do you consider, for instance, Chester County not to be a hotbed of opioid use? <laughs> First of all, understand there are no borders or boundaries, okay? Um, unfortunately, I can't bring up uh, the slides to show you. Uh, however, I have what we call a heat map of the United States, and it shows opioid use in the year 2000, and it shows opioid use today. And it just lights up across the country. There are very, very few areas that are not at risk. So as I said, there's no borders, there's no boundaries. Chester County, Delaware County, Montgomery County, they, we all have problems. Um, what we do in our heroin task force is we educate, okay? The whole mission was prevention, education, awareness, and treatment. Um, the earlier you get to the uh, individual to educate, the better the results. We take our program to the schools. We work with partners. Um, it's, it's a collaborative effort, and the entire community is part of it. Chester County has got some great programs and some great people working on, on their uh, end of things. Uh, we interact a lot. And uh, as a matter of fact, the uh, chairman of our, uh, the executive director of our Delaware County Medical Society is also the executive director of the Chester County Medical Society. 
and he, his name is David McKeegan, he's a great guy. He works together with the people of uh, Philadelphia and all the surrounding counties, so we, we work as a team. But if, how much does a package of the NARC can cost? Well, that's a good question, I like that one, okay. <laughs> Narcan nasal spray is covered by pretty much every insurance company out there, okay? And the overwhelming majority of it has a minimal copay. It might be $10, it might be $20, and that's it. The um, product is also available without prescription, okay? It's what's called standing orders. So that if you had a relative, a very close friend, family member, neighbor, whoever that you were concerned about, legitimately concerned about, and you wanted to you know, have Narcan available in the event they needed it, all you have to do is go to the pharmacist and say, I would like to have a uh, box of the nasal Narcan spray. As I mentioned, it comes two units per box. You do not need a written prescription. <clears throat> it is kept with the pharmacist is kept behind the counter. It's not over the counter, but it's readily available. In the worst case scenario where someone would have to actually put money out of pocket to purchase it, the, um, the retail price is about probably $125 for the two units. But as I said, it is very well covered on insurances and all types of insurance, whether it be uh, medical assistance or private pay. I was thinking more of if cover if libraries wanted to post it, because from what I gathered from the article in the Inquirer, that people who are using these opioid problems in some cases would shoot up whatever you want to call it. They use the libraries. They like use them in libraries. Mm -hmm. And I just was wondering that those I was just wondering if we could suggest that it be available in all large libraries. I you know what we um, and I guess each jurisdiction is going to determine where they're going to put it and how it's going to be distributed. Plus there's many different groups that are focused on um, educating and, and also providing Narcan. What we've done is everywhere that we have an AED, a defibrillator to treat uh, cardiac arrest, we're putting Narcan down. We went to all the universities. You know, we approached the universities. You know, they have a lot of young students, and, and God forbid something happens there, you want to be able to, uh, to immediately provide treatment. So, yes. Um, I think it's important to saturate the community with the product. It's a life-saving product. Quick question um, from the, maybe more of a psychological perspective. If you hear or read about people who have uh, addictive personalities, mm -hmm. more prone to, to look for things such as this. And I also see that a lot of the abuse of these drugs occurs in, for instance, Appalachia. West Virginia, Kentucky, the very depressed areas, high unemployment, no, no prospects, uh, doom and gloom kind of scenarios. Um, some of those to me don't seem to be derived from pain issues as much as other triggers that are causing that they're using just as someone might pick up a bottle and drink. People are picking up pills or needles to escape from their reality. Uh, do we see much of that type of abuse around here, and this is not Appalachia, but, mm -hmm. or is it more the extension of uh, my pain medication is running out, I can't get it anymore, it's too expensive, so I'm gonna go see my dealer? Yeah, we see both, we see both. I would probably think we see more of the uh, transition from analgesic use mm -hmm. into uh, potential addiction. However, it's an important point there is a mental health component. And what we've done is in our, in our Harlem task force, we have the Office of Behavioral Health put a representative at the table with us. So we see it, we realize that it's a concern. And yes, you know, we look at uh, every individual and, and there's you know, different paths to addiction and, and we can deal with them appropriately. Obviously, the most, the best intervention is prevention. Mm -hmm. And that's the main focus. 
as I mentioned, you know, we look at prevention, education, awareness, and treatment. Mm -hmm. And you know, if we can prevent the individual from getting to the point where they're addicted, mm -hmm. we've really made the most impact on the problem. Great. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank, thank, thank you, Dr. George, for thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you so much for the great presentation, the great work that you and the group is doing uh, to help this opioid um, epidemic. Uh, we really appreciate you coming here and appreciate everybody else uh, in here and also the people that they are following us. Uh, just just for everybody to know, every month, the first Saturday of the month at 11 o'clock, we are going to have one of the referring doctors who is going to come and present something that our community is in need so much. Next month, we are going to have uh, a doctor, Dr. Schwartz, who's coming and talking about diabetes and diabetes neuropathy because that also relates to our patients. And the very next month in December, Dr. Ross Narian, who is uh, next door, who has a dental clinic open till 12 midnight and during Saturdays and Sundays, which is a very unique <laughs> dental clinic, which I've never heard of. Uh, he is going to talk about? Geriatric dentistry. Geriatric dentistry. So I uh, hope to see everybody here. And also just, just an update. We are running a balance assessment test the entire month of October, and we know, and it's totally for free, just to prevent people from falling. Just like you were saying, preventative work is much more important, as much as important to, to the work that we can do, just in case if the person already fell into the opioid or really fell. So uh, just pass by anytime you would like, and we can give you the 10 minute assessment test, which is totally free, and you can do whatever you would like afterwards. You can, um, if there is no need for you to t take therapy, that would be great, if uh, in case we can talk about it then. Thank you so much again, and Thank enjoy you. your weekend. Thank, Thank you. you. I have a question for you privately. Do you know what to do? Wait, 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 wait. wait. <laughs>